Thank you for that introduction. Uh, we are not going to be talking about progressive web apps. We are going to be talking about other things you can do with service workers other than make progressive web apps. So to get started, I want to ask you all by a show of your hands, how many of you have heard of Atwood's Law before? OK, only a couple of you. Always surprises me. I thought more people knew about this. So Atwood's Law comes from Jeff Atwood, who's better known online as Coding Horror. He has a blog, active on Twitter. But anyways, about 11 years ago, he had this quote where he said, any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. Now, at the time he said this, it was kind of just a funny observation. But over the past 11 years, it's become remarkably accurate and remarkably true, especially as JavaScript's gotten more powerful, the language has evolved, the web platform has become more prevalent on mobile devices. And I think that's one of, the, one of the things that I really love about JavaScript in the web development community is we build lots of stuff and we've pushed the language into places where I think people never really expected it to go. We now use JavaScript as the primary language to build our chat clients like Slack, our music players like Spotify, and even our development tools like Visual Studio Code. But we don't just build new things. We can also recreate old applications like Winamp and do it completely in the browser and cross-platform now. We can even use JavaScript to do things like re-implement runtimes for Java or Ruby. Now, I don't know why you would want to do this, but you can do it, and that's really cool in my opinion. <laughs> I think it's really astounding what JavaScript enables developers to do these days. And that's at the heart of what I want to talk about today. But to tee that up even further, I want to talk about progressive web apps for a moment. So progressive web apps, like the new mobile Twitter website, are applications on the web that have native-like features, such as push notifications, the ability to serve content offline, be installed to the home screen of your mobile device, and a couple other features that are in the pipes. They're essentially supercharged web apps that attempt to bridge the gap between the web platform and native platforms. Now, at the heart of these is a technology called service workers. And we've seen case studies from companies like Flipkart, which is an e-commerce site, showing that this has been a great boost to their, to their business. And now even much larger companies like Starbucks are jumping on this train and building progressive web apps. And like I mentioned, at the heart of this is really a technology called service workers. And unfortunately, I think service workers have gotten this reputation of pretty much only being used for progressive web app features. But they're actually really interesting bits of technology that I think could enable a lot of cool creativity and experimentation on the web platform. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, how we can go beyond progressive web apps with service workers. And so we're going to look at a, quite a bit of code. And so I hope you're fueled up after lunch. And hopefully all those carbs didn't put you into napping mode. But before we jump into all of that, a bit about who am I? My name is Trent Willis. You can find me on Twitter at Trent M. Willis. I'm a senior UI engineer at Netflix. And while that's pretty interesting and I'd love to talk to you about it, that's not really important for this talk. The important thing is to know that I'm someone that loves the web and I love JavaScript because I found a lot of creativity and freedom to build cool things on those platforms. And what's really exciting to me about this particular moment in web development history that we find ourselves is how rapidly JavaScript and the web platform is evolving and how many opportunities that brings with it for us to experiment and to try out new things. And that's really what spurred this entire talk for me. About a year and a half ago, I found a really interesting nugget of information on the web about what the web platform is capable of doing now. And I decided to experiment with it, run with it, see how far I could push it. So what was that interesting piece of information? Well, I was reading a specification from the web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, more commonly known as WhatWig. WhatWig is one of the standards bodies that defines specifications for various web APIs. And I was reading their specification for the Streams API, which aims to bring a set of interfaces to the web that allows you to interact with streaming data. This is pretty common in the Node.js world, but up until recently, there was no built-in primitive for it on the web platform. But what was really interesting to me is that in the introduction of the specification, one of the potential use cases they identified was this, that if a stream is installed inside the fetch hook of a service worker, this would allow developers to transparently polyfill new image formats. And this got me thinking, hey, that's a pretty interesting idea. 
I had never considered using service workers for things other than just building progressive web apps. But as I thought about this more and more, I came to the realization that this doesn't just have to be limited to new image formats. It could be used for a whole lot of different other things. And so the first idea I want to talk about today is how you can use service workers to transparently polyfill new file formats in the browser. Beyond just images, we could use this to do things like ship new video encodings or new types of audio formats or even different types of code. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's back up and talk about how is this actually possible? Like what is the architecture behind it? What is the design pattern that we're going to be working with? So if we imagine that we have a file that's written in a new image format and we want to display it in the browser, we'd like to be able to use a normal image element where we can just insert it like any other image type. However, if you were to try to do this today, it would not work because browsers expect the images to be in a format that they understand, such as a PNG, a JPEG, a GIF, and so forth. So what this means is that we need the image in this new format to become a format that the browser understands before we try to display it. And that's where service workers enter into this equation. Many of us are likely aware that service workers aid in developing progressive web apps, but what we might not think of them as more commonly is just a proxy or a middleman that sits between our application or our code on the client and any external resources we try to talk to, like APIs or CDNs or servers. But if we think of them in that light, it becomes a little more obvious how we can do some very interesting things like polyfill new types of images. And we do it by intercepting the response from our server as it's coming back to the client and modifying it. And so what happens is we can load a file that is in a .nif or some other new format and then transform it into something like a GIF. And then the browser will render it and be none the wiser because it'll think that it is just a normal image. So that's the high level idea. Let's jump into some code here. Now I want to note before we get into all of this that all of this code is going to be available online. Uh, there will be links to demos throughout. So don't worry about taking exhaustive notes. Uh, there's quite a bit and it's kind of dense. So let's get to it. We're going to start by creating a service worker. And we do this by calling the navigator.serviceworker.register API. And you provided a file path to the script that you want to execute. Now in that file, there are two concepts that we really need to understand from service workers. The first is what is known as a fetch event. A fetch event is simply a JavaScript event that gets emitted to the service worker anytime a request is made from the browser. And this isn't just JavaScript initiated requests like XHRs or fetch requests. It happens for all sorts of things on the page, including requests for scripts or assets loaded from your style sheets. So this event contains a whole bunch of information about the request that is occurring, as well as some other metadata. And on this event, there is also a request object, which has a bunch of different methods and details that you can use to modify that event. Now, having this information by itself doesn't do a whole lot for us, right? Because we don't want to just see the requests as they're happening. We want to be able to do something with them, transform them. And so the second API that we need to be familiar with is on the event itself and is called the respond with method. This method allows you to take that fetch event and say, hey, instead of responding with the normal network response, respond with this other value instead. And this is really a really important part of this specification, this API, because this is actually how we enable offline content to be served. Because we're able to say, hey, don't go to the network for this data. Instead, just use this value that I already have in the cache. So into this method, we are actually going to pass a different, a result from another function, which is going to take our polyfill or our new file format and transform it into a file format that the browser understands. So one other thing that you might want to do here is guard that guard that transformation to ensure that you're only operating on requests that need it. And by default, if you're listening for fetch events, but you don't do anything to that event, you don't call the respond with method or one of the several other APIs, the browser will behave as normal. And so there's no negative impact to other parts of your application by inserting this logic. So inside this method, we're going to transform our request into something that the browser can understand. And the architecture that we're going to generally follow, the pattern, looks something like this. 
we start by fetching the original request because we need that data from our server still. But then we can take the response from it and access its data in some form. In this case, we're using the dot blob method, but there's also dot text, dot JSON, or dot array buffer. Whatever format you want to work on the data in is fine. You can then modify that data however you want. In this case, we defined a transform function where we're passing in the polyfilled data and we can transform it. And then the only expectation is that the result is then something that the browser can understand. We can then construct a new response from that data and then return it. And then that's pretty much it. Now obviously the implementation for exactly what you're polyfilling is probably going to be a bit more complicated, but that's the high level idea in structure. So we're going to jump into a quick demo. Uh, hopefully this works out well. Uh, oh, I need to turn off screen sharing. Bear with me a second, sorry. Okay, here we go. So let me increase the font size a bit here. So let's go into demo one here. And run npm start. And so this is just starting up a small application that's serving some files. So if we jump over to our browser, have the application tab open in the dev tools, which is really important when you're working with service workers. And you'll notice that here, we're actually skipping the service worker. We're bypassing it to go to the network instead. And unfortunately, I was unable to test this beforehand, but the contrast isn't super great. But we're getting a message that says, the image below will not render without an active service worker, because we're able to detect that. But if we were to enable the service worker and reload the page, we actually get an image that works. And we can see this in the network by checking that we're loading this .epng file. And by default, let me close the console here. We get this garbled mess of characters. But the result that's being returned from our service worker is actually an understandable image, and the browser can render it. Let's jump back to the presentation now. So this demo you can find online with a lot more detail in it about at cryptogram-naive.glitch.me. So Glitch, for those of you that aren't aware, is just a site kind of like JSBen or Code Sandbox where you can host applications and small little projects. Um, I think it's wonderful for doing experiments like this. But so that's the basic idea. We are able to implement in totally new features in the browser that previously would have required changes to the browser itself in order to support. We can do this just with JavaScript now. So let's push this idea a little bit further. What if we could polyfill completely new extensions to the web platform, like new APIs? And the first idea that struck me, because I used to do a lot of development with native web components and Polymer as my framework of choice, is what if we were able to import HTML into JavaScript modules? And we were able to use those in the browser. And so that's the second avenue which I pursued. So we're going to take a quick look at that as well. Let's jump out of here. Turn back on mirroring and jump over to the terminal. Okay. So I'm going to change over to demo two. And I'm actually going to open this up in VS Code for a second so we can take a look at it. And so in here we have an HTML module or a JavaScript module that's actually importing a .html file. And so we can go and take a look at this file and see if that it's just a bunch of JavaScript, or not JavaScript, HTML, um, with no JavaScript present. And yet we're able to access it inside our JavaScript file as a template element. Um, template elements, for those of you that don't know, is a feature that's in the web browser supported natively to allow you to clone HTML markup pretty easily. And so with that in place, if we fire up our server here and jump back over to the browser, we're going to bypass the network at first and we have nothing rendering because it's not working. But if we enable the service worker now and reload the page, what we'll see is we can actually render all of that markup. 
And what's great is we can use this just like any other DOM. And so once we have it imported, we can actually uh, add event listeners to it, query it, and so we can bind event listeners to the buttons. And so I think this would be a really fantastic way for us to start moving away from necessarily needing frameworks to build our web applications if a feature like this was supported natively in the browser. And it's really exciting to me because there are standards bodies that are talking about these sorts of features, but you're not, you previously were not able to polyfill them. And so they would have to talk about it, argue about it for a long time, and then maybe eventually a browser would implement it and then you could try it out. Now you could actually implement these ideas and try them out locally and then actually be able to give constructive feedback to those discussions on standards work. Let's see, okay. Let's jump back to our presentation here. And so this demo you can also find online at html-modules.polyfill.glitch.me. So that about wraps it up for this first idea of being able to transparently polyfill new features to the browser. Except let's push it a bit further. And what if we were able to compile new types of code at runtime? This is in the same vein as that previous idea, but comes with a caveat. When I first started diving into this world, the thing that most excited me is, what if I would be able to compile TypeScript at runtime in the browser? What if I didn't need to set up a build chain locally and I could just write a .ts file and load it up into my browser and it would work? I think this would be a really awesome win for being able to prototype and experiment with TypeScript without having to go through all the tedium of setting up your TypeScript or maybe integrate it with Webpack or Babel or what, what have you. Now, I definitely wouldn't recommend doing this in production because it's probably gonna be kind of slow, but what about for development? I think it seems reasonable. What if you could import your .ts files like this in the browser? What if you could use the new module syntax that's actually supported by all of the big browsers these days? There is a catch to this, catch to this. Maybe I should have said cache. And that is that we need to use some sort of caching to avoid having to build all of those files each time you load it. Because once you get beyond you know, a trivial web app, you might have dozens of modules that you're loading and that can be really slow if you're going to have to compile all of those at runtime. Thankfully though, the browser and along with the service workers API provides a nice API for us to do that through the caches API. And so we can actually implement it such that we only compile files that have changed. And so this introduces the caches API, which we'll take a look at now. So let's say we have a function inside our service worker that we're going to call compile with cache. This essentially takes the place of the transform that we had from our code earlier. What it's going to do is it's going to take in a response from a fetch request and then a compile function. In this case, we might pass in the compiler from TypeScript, which does actually work in the browser. We'll get to that in a moment. We'll start by calling an open method on the global caches object so that way we can get a cache and you can namespace these. So this one we're calling compile cache. And then once we have that, we can check something like maybe the headers and Certain APIs set a status code, which reflects the HTTP, HTTP status. And if it's something like 304, which says that the resource hasn't been modified, then we can simply return the value that we currently have in our cache. Note that the caches API in the browser isn't a generic cache. It actually works specifically with request objects and response objects or URLs. And this is because it's meant to serve a specific purpose and that, is, that purpose is to help with caching network data. But thankfully, for our purposes, it works just fine. If the value has been modified, if the response has been modified or is not a 304, we can look at the, com the response, compile it, and then put it into the cache. Now, one interesting thing to call out here is that when we're putting it into the cache, we actually have to call a clone method on the response that we created. And the reason for this is that a response object can only be used by the browser once. And thus, if we use it for both our cache and to return from our service worker, we get an error. Now, I actually do not know why this is. So if anyone does, please come talk to me. I'd be really curious to know because I could not find an answer for it online. But then after that, we just simply return the compiled response and it should work. So here we go. We're gonna jump into another demo here to show that I'm not just blowing smoke. So. Hearing displays back on. 
So let's go to demo three. Let's clear that up. Open this in Visual Studio Code. And so we can see here now that we have our index.html, which is importing an app.js file. Unfortunately, one caveat that I haven't mentioned is that you actually have to wait for your service worker to be ready before you can use any of these strategies, which is why I think it's a good idea for experimenting with stuff and doing things in development, but maybe not necessarily production. But that depends on your requirements. Anyways, from here, we're importing a .ts file, hello world, which is pretty similar to the one that we had in our last example where it's a custom element or a web component. And it's using some TypeScript features like type annotations. And then this also imports another TypeScript file, which imports another TypeScript file and so forth. And so it's a kind of non-trivial, but not super advanced TypeScript example. Now if we go fire this up and jump over to our browser, let's bypass the network to start. Nothing renders, and we can actually see if we go to the console here that we're getting errors with the server responded with a non-JavaScript MIME type because the browser doesn't know what a .ts or TypeScript file is. But if we go back to our application and enable the service worker that I have in place, we will see that, voila, it works. And you can actually check this out in the sources panel and see that we're loading it, and this is actually showing the compiled output from the TypeScript compiler. And so you can see that the type annotations have been removed and the transformations that TypeScript does have been completed. But so, I don't know about you all, but this excites me a lot because I love TypeScript, but I hate setting up build tooling. So let's jump back to our slide deck. So as with all the other demos, you can find this on Glitch at typescript-in-browser.glitch.me. Okay, so we've talked about polyfilling file formats, no build TypeScript. What else could we do with service workers? Well, one idea that's maybe not as exciting as those others is being able to process data before it ever hits the main thread, processing it off the main thread. And I'm not just talking JavaScript data. We can already do that with web workers. The traditional model of fetching data in a web app is that you make a request from your main JavaScript thread, and then you process it on that same thread once the data has returned from your API. This has the drawback, as most of us are aware of, of potentially blocking the main thread if you have to do lots of work. This problem becomes a bit more interesting in the case of service workers because you can actually make requests from anywhere on your UI thread, right? As I've shown, we could be handling a request that's being imported by a script, coming from our style sheet, or maybe an image tag. And so we're doing a lot of processing in the service worker with these things that I've talked about. The problem is service workers are also single threaded because it's still JavaScript. And what happens if you block the service worker? Well, you actually block any possible requests that the page might be making. And that becomes a really big problem, especially because service workers can be active on more than one domain at a time. We'll talk about that in a moment. And so you can wind up with a bottleneck here. So as I was thinking through this problem and encountered it in some of my experiments, I came to this idea like, well, what if we could offload that work from the service worker into a web worker and have a flow that kind of looked like this? And after some research, I decided like, this should definitely be possible. But it came with a catch. You can't create a web worker from inside a service worker. And so that was a problem that I had to solve. But it is actually solvable. And so with this model, we'd be able to do all of our processing inside the web worker instead. Now, we're gonna jump into the code for this. Uh, of all the ideas I talk about today, this is the one that I am least sure of. It definitely works. Whether or not it's a good idea is up for you to decide. <laughs> so we're going to start at the point at which the page makes a request. And as before, we'd have our event handler and we can take the request from that fetch event and then we can pass it into a method that we're going to call transform. And we have our request and we have an ID that represents the client. The request obviously is the request that's being made. And then the client ID is actually an identifier of which page. And the reason this is needed is because a service worker is activated per domain, not per instance of the page. It's not bound to a specific tab in your browser. 
And so for instance, if you go to the new mobile Twitter site and have multiple tabs open with that same Twitter page, you will actually have a single service worker instance that is shared amongst all of those instances. And so we need some way to identify which page is making the request. And so there's this client ID property that we get. So inside our transform function here, we're going to fetch the request like we have before, but then we're going to invoke this function called get port to web worker from client. And so this is something that we're going to write. What it's going to do is going to help us figure out how we can communicate to a web worker to offload all of this work. So in order to get the port, we first have to get the client from the service worker that is making the request, which is pretty straightforward according to the service worker API that they give us. And next, we return a promise. This promise is going to resolve once we have that port to our web worker. So in that promise, we're going to post a message to the client. It doesn't matter what the message is because we're not gonna have a bunch of different types of events. And so all we're really saying here is, hey, ask the page how we can communicate with the web worker. On our page, we can then create a web worker and listen to a message coming from the service worker. Once we get a message, we can create a message channel. So a message channel is a relatively obscure web API that actually allows you to create two event listeners or two objects that are event listeners and they communicate with each other. What's unique about them is that they can be transferred between different execution contexts. So you can pass them to web workers, to service workers, to shared web workers, or to the main thread. And what this does is it allows you to post messages from one execution context to another. So these isolated threads that previously were not able to talk to each other can now talk to each other. And so with that in place, we can take the first one and post it to our service worker, and then take the second one and post it into the web worker. And with this in place, we'll now be able to have the service worker and web worker communicate back and forth between each other through these ports. Back inside the service worker then, once we receive a message back from the client, we can take the port from that message and resolve our promise. And now we know how to talk to the web worker. Okay, so we got our port, we fetched the original data. Now we want to return a new promise where we're going to post the message into the web worker, say, hey web worker, here's our data, do with it whatever you want. And then once we sent the data, once we get a message back, we can then resolve this new promise with the data that we received from the web worker. And that's it, it's not complicated at all, right? So we get the result back and this does work. And I put together a somewhat contrived demo to show exactly the effect that it can have for us. So I wanted to look at two demos here real quick. The first one is a naive implementation. So let's go to demo 4A here. Um, start it up. Oops. Okay. So in this demo, where did my cursor go? What we're doing is we fetch some data. I don't know if you saw it happen. And then we try to complete some other requests while that data is getting processed inside the service worker. We're just doing some complex mathematical computation to simulate a lot of work being done. And so you, you can see don't, we're only able to complete about two requests during this processing. And that's unfortunately not very good if you're trying to like make a bunch of requests such as when a page initially loads. However, if we were to implement the architecture that I just talked about, start that up. Let's make sure that this current service worker is unregistered and reload the page. Yep. There we go. We can complete about 240 requests in the same amount of time. Now obviously this number is highly variable and depends on your network latency. So like for this demo, all we're doing is fetching the result from the local file system so it's really quick. But even testing it in the browser, what I saw was that you would still be able to complete probably in the neighborhood of like 10x the number of requests. And so this is really important if you're doing lots of work. And so for instance, in the TypeScript example, it would be great if we could offload all that compilation work into the web worker rather than having to do it in the service worker.
Ooh, I have lost my cursor. Let's jump back over here. Okay. So you can find the first example of the naive implementation at service-worker-blocker.glitch.me. And then you can find the improved version at service-worker-worker.glitch.me. Okay, so final idea that, that I wanna talk about. We wanted to talk about processing data as its streams. So way back towards the beginning of the talk, I mentioned the streams API, and we haven't talked about it at all. And that's because it turns out there's a lot you can do without it. But if you're dealing with a large data set, it might actually be very helpful to be able to stream that data. And the reason is, is because in the models of everything that we've shown so far, what we're doing is we're effectively downloading all of this data and then transforming it all. And this can be pretty inefficient because we're having to hold all of this data in memory twice and do all of this work in one big batch. Now for small, small things, this is fine. But if you were to deal with large data sets, such as large images, this can potentially become pretty wasteful and resource intensive. And so this is effectively a form of batch processing. But there's a way that we can make this better, make it more efficient for our browser. And that is, for some use cases, we can use stream processing. And what stream processing is, is essentially just processing data as it arrives. Conceptually though, if you're not familiar with it, we're going to walk through it. You start by getting a chunk of data from your server. And once you have that chunk, you can start processing it, modifying it, transforming it, whatever you need to do. And then while that's happening, you can download another chunk of data. And then you simply repeat this process until you have processed everything that needs to be processed. And the end, the end result is that a lot of the work that you previously did after downloading all of the data can be done while you're downloading that data. Now this still won't wind up being as fast as not having to do any work, but it should be faster than the naive solution for some use cases. Like I said, for small data sets, this is not a worthwhile optimization because you won't notice and may actually potentially lose performance because it does involve a little bit of overhead. But so with this idea in place, we can take our polyfill function from earlier, from the first demo, and actually transform it a bit so that we do something a little bit different. We start now by fetching the original data, but then we can construct a transform stream with a transformer object. I'll talk more a bit about that in a second, but essentially this will be what now transforms our data. We can then take the body property of the original response and pipe it through that transform stream. And so what you may not notice here is that previously on the original response, we called a method like .json or .text and we had to await or wait for it because it was async. This method is not async because it gives us access to a readable stream of the data as it arrives over time. And so this was actually introduced with the streams specification that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And is, in my opinion, a really interesting feature and probably has a lot of cool use cases that could be uncovered. Anyways, with that transform stream, you get back a transformed body and then you can simply construct a new response and then return that from your function. So this transformer object is really the heart of this implementation now. And a transformer is defined in the stream specification as an object that can optionally have a start method, a transform method, and a flush method. And all of these can return promises. At a high level, the start method, all it does is sets up any state that you might need to do the transformation. It doesn't receive any data or really any information about the stream. The transform method is then where you actually receive chunks of data, you can process them and then enqueue them into the output, or you can completely ignore them if you want. And this can be asynchronous, so if you need to do some async task to process it, you can do that. And then finally, flush happens once the stream has signaled that it's closed, and is no longer sending any data, you can do cleanup, do any final processing that you might wanna do. Cool, so last demo of the day here. Let's jump over to our terminal, go to demo five. And this is going to look, ooh, actually, Let's open this up in code first. So what we have here is the service worker and stuff is pretty similar to the one that we had from before. And so the end result is that the browser behavior should look more or less the same. Here though, we can see the image slowly arriving over time, showing that it's been streamed in. In fact, you can even check it in the console because I log out for each message that comes in. <coughs> 
Now, you might pause here and say, though, like, Trent, this looks really slow. This is probably not a good idea. Um, but this is just because I slowed it down on purpose. This image is like, I think, 20 megs in size or something like that. Um, and I put a set timeout in so that way you can actually see the process. Because otherwise, if I disable the set timeout and reload, it's pretty fast. Like, you can see the console statements, but you can't really see it actually popping in. Um, so there you have it, streams. So as with all the other ones, let's get this started back up. You can find this at cryptogram-streaming.glitch.me. Okay, so we've covered a whole lot of stuff. Um, I imagine that there's probably a good number of APIs that I mentioned that you might not be super familiar with. Uh, but to recap, the first idea we talked about was simply that you could use service workers to transparently polyfill new file formats, including new code formats, which you could compile at runtime and use the cache API to help alleviate some of that burden if you wanted to do that. You could then also process that data off the main thread and use web workers in conjunction with service workers to really get some efficient data processing going. And then finally, you can process the data as it streams to your client, which helps, especially in the case of large data payloads. So we looked at a lot of stuff today, but the code and all of that, in my opinion, is not the real point of this talk. What I want you to walk out of here with is this knowledge that we have a lot of cool new primitives on the web that allow us to do things that were just previously not possible. Like straight up, you could not do some of these things. And so what we have now is these are all just tools to build things, to build new ideas, experiment, push the web platform into directions that it previously could not go. And so I wanna encourage you all to go build something. Before I gave this talk, I was not super familiar with most of these APIs. I learned a lot in this process. I'm still not a thorough expert in most of them, but I have a much greater appreciation for what the web platform can do and where it's going. And so I wanna encourage you all, go build something. Have some fun. I want to end by saying, go forth and fulfill Outwood's law. Like, write everything that you can think of in JavaScript. If there's some app out there that you think is really cool and you're like, ah, oh, I couldn't build that with JavaScript, try to build it. It might work. And have fun in the process. And if you do build something, put it up in a public place like on Glitch, so that way others can learn from it, be inspired by it, and maybe, maybe, you'll be able to influence the direction of the community for the better. So as a final note, if you wanna look at the demos that I have as well as a couple others, I put them all up in a collection on Glitch at glitch.com slash at Trent M. Willis slash fun with service workers. Um, I'll also be tweeting out all this information after the talk, so follow me on Twitter. Come chat with me, I'd love to talk to you. That's the primary reason I come to conferences. Uh, thank you, you've been a wonderful audience.